Hey guys, welcome back. Schizo in episode 18. Topic today is going to be more on solving linear systems, in particular using LU decomposition or factorization. And uh, currently my cats are going nuts and the neighbors are boring to the center of the earth. So a lot of distractions, but don't let that distract you because it's a very important video. First question, why are we bothering with, with these systems of linear equations? And the reason is, because almost everything, like 90% of things in science and engineering are linear or can be assumed to be linear. And when you have multiple things mutually interacting or somehow connected in a network, um, you ideally wanna solve all of these equations at once. And that would be a system of linear equations. And that's a huge part of structural analysis, physics simulations, circuit analysis, statistics, and so many more things. So it's extremely important, and that's why we put a lot of effort into implementing this in a nice, quick, elegant way. And this reminded me a lot of the tutorial island interaction between the player and the chef tutor in uh, Old School RuneScape. Didn't we do this before, just now? Like, Lab 1 was about Kramer's rule. Didn't we do this? Didn't we solve linear systems? Yes, but that's not really a good way to do it. Um, there are much better ways, including the one in today's video. Just to jog our memories, what is what does it mean to solve a linear system or system of linear equations? Well, here's a word problem from first grade. Uh, theater production charges $21 for adult tickets, 15 for students. They sell 102 tickets for almost two grand. How much do they make? You know, how many each type did they sell? The idea is you make two equations. Equation one being that of the revenue, so 21a plus 15s equals the proceeds. And then equation two is that of the number of tickets, A plus S equals 102. So A is number of adult tickets sold, S is number of student tickets. And the idea is that these equations somehow contain information that when you, even if you were to plot them, find the intersection, you would see that uh, they're both satisfied at that crossing point and you were supposed to solve for A and S. So in this case, the way I was taught to, to, to do this is I would take equation two, multiply it by 15 and subtract it from equation one. That would remove the S term um, and then I would solve for A, 67. I plug that back into equation two to solve for S, 35. And then you can check your work and plug numbers back in and see that it, it's the correct answer. Alternately, you can form this as a matrix problem, like this on the right hand side here. So this big matrix two by two is the co coefficient matrix. So you have 21, 15, one, one as elements. You have your unknown vector and then you have the right hand side known from the equations. And ultimately, the same approach is valid for these for these matrix problems as well. We just refer to these things a little bit differently. We call this kind of operation here an elementary row operation and we refer to this, you know, plug and chug as forward and backward substitution. We'll talk about those more in a few minutes. That's kind of where LU decomposition comes in. And what this is ultimately is just taking advantage of a particularly easy type of system to solve, and that is a triangular system. So what does that mean? It means a system that has zeros above or below the main diagonal. And why is that so nice? Because this basically means you can just solve the full equation, all the equations just with substitution, because you already have one of the unknowns basically, and you can just take that value and plug it into all the other equations and solve for the other unknowns. So there's very little thinking required once you have a triangular system. And so the idea behind LU is basically you factor A into two pieces. You're not cutting it in half, you're not dividing it in half, you're just reconstructing two other matrices that have the form of lower and upper triangularity that when you multiply them together, you get A again. Why do you do this? Well, it's because if you take LU and plug it into this ex equation here, AX equals B, A being the vector of coefficient or matrix of coefficients, X being your unknown vector and B being your known vector, you uh, basically can plug in your factored components, L and U, and then you can solve this instead of a complicated, dense, system like a originally was 
you have two triangular matrices L and U, and you can break you know UX into an intermediate unknown vector Y and solve L Y is B, solve for Y. Um, again, this is easy because you have a triangular matrix here. We'll talk about what that means in a second. Uh, and then once you have solved for Y, Y being U times X, you can solve for X. So the overall process is this. Step one, you factor that system, that A, into an L and a U, upper and lower triangular matrix. Um, and we're going to use a Doolittle algorithm. We're going to have ones along the diagonal of L for a couple of reasons. We'll talk about that later. Step two would be to use forward substitution to solve for the intermediate vector Y. Then you'd use backward substitution to solve for the unknown vector x, and that's your answer to the problem. So step two and three are very easy. Step one is a bit more complex, but even still, it's not all that challenging. So what does it mean to solve these triangular systems? Why did I say forward and backward substitution is so nice? Well, here's an example. So, so you have this matrix, 1, 0, 0, 3, 2, 0, 1, 4, 3, lower triangular times an unknown vector x, y, z equals some known right-hand side. Now, x is already solved for, you know, row times column, x is 5, right? That's, that should just be obvious. Um, the idea is, you know x is 5, take that value and remove all contributions of x to any other equations in this system. So what you do is, I can subtract off three x's from row two, both in terms of the coefficients on the left and on the right. So I'm gonna subtract off three times x, and what is x equal to? Five, so I'm taking three off the coefficient and three times x, or three times five, off the right-hand side. Similarly, for equation three here at the, the bottom row, take one off the x coefficient and one times x off of the right-hand side multiplication, the product. You do that, you basically put zeros along the f entire first column outside of the diagonal element, or I should say below diagonal element. So yeah, you've done something productive very quickly. Now, Y is trivial to solve for. If you think about it, because if you take this row times this column, Y is obviously equal to six. You have Y equals six, now you can subtract off contributions of y to the other lower equations. So in this case, we're going to subtract off four times y from equation three, both in terms of the coefficient as well as the right-hand side. y was six, so 45 minus four times six, you now have this equation. At this point, now z is trivial to solve for because you can take this row times this column. Obviously, z is seven, and uh, now you're done. So you can see very, very simple math, simple algorithm can be implemented to solve a triangular system, both lower triangular and as you could imagine, upper triangular as well. So in summary, triangular matrices are very good. Now, that's great, but how do we get these fabled triangular matrices? How can we go from a fully dense matrix like this to a lower and upper factor? Well, it's pretty easy. Um, there, are, there are algorithms you could use, but ultimately it's a pretty straightforward approach. You could do it by hand because it's, it's kind of like, um, like Sudoku in a way. Basically, you, we're gonna assume first off the diagonal elements of this lower triangular matrix in orange are ones. I think that makes our solution unique. I'm not sure about that, but I, I'm pretty sure. Um, and then the elements above the diagonal are going to be zeros. On the contrary, for the lower, for the upper triangular matrix, um, diagonal elements are unknown, and elements below that diagonal are zeros. So right off the bat, you can immediately find the entire first row of the unknown matrix. Um, but let's start simple here. So if you think about it, the first row, first column of this dense matrix has to be the product of the first row of L, the first column of U. That means that the unknown question mark entry here has to be one, right? If you think about row times column, that has to be a one. Now you can solve for this question mark entry here because you know this one element is the product of this row times this column. And so 
we know that that question mark has to also be a one. Now, what can you do? Well, if you want to solve for uh, this question mark uh, entry right here, you can do so by multiplying you know, this row times this column. The zero kills that question mark. And basically, you know that this question mark has to be a four. You've got that. Now you can solve for um, this question mark right here. If you think about it, this row times this column has to multiply to negative one. That question mark must be a negative one. Similarly, the last question mark in that row must also be a one for a similar you know, process. This row times this column has to give you a one. That entry must be a one. Okay, great. How about the middle question mark here? Well, if you take the middle row times middle column, that's supposed to equal two. Therefore, that question mark must be a three. Okay, great. Now you have a two at the uh, third row, second column of this, this matrix. How, how do you get that? Well, that means that this question mark needs to be a two. And now this last column of the you know U matrix, how can we get, uh, get this question mark here? Well, take this row times this column. The zero kills that question mark. So you know that this entry for this question mark needs to be a two. And lastly, you can solve for the last question mark, taking the last row times the last column has to be one. Therefore, your last unknown needs to be a negative seven. And if you were to multiply this matrix times this matrix, you would get this matrix. So that's kind of the process. It's a very simple process. You can do it by hand very easily to construct the LU factorization for any matrix. You always have enough information. Well, maybe not always, but usually have enough information, assuming there's not a bunch of zeros in this, um, to, to construct this factorization. And in fact, if we know that the diagonal elements of L are always going to be one, we can just assume we know that. And in that case, you only have these elements and these elements to encode because you know that these are all zeros, these are all zeros, and these are all ones. In that case, you can fit that entire construction into the original memory space. So you can basically replace A with the factorization of A, and you can basically embed those coefficients into the original memory space. That's the idea. However, if you're not organized about this, you might delete or overwrite things that you need. This approach that I did may not have been in the ideal order to preserve elements that we used. Um, and so there are algorithms you can use. You can look them up. Here's the one that I implemented in the code today. Um, and this basically means that if you use this approach and you kind of go in this sequence diagonally, you will never overwrite an element that you need for a future operation. And you can still safely use the original memory space of the A matrix to encode your LU factorization. And if you want to take a look, that's in the linear algebra directory under LU decomposition in the SoyHub suppository. Now, last thing to talk about is what about this pivoting nonsense? Well, the question is, if you look at my note here, um, there's an operation in this algorithm that div involves dividing by diagonal elements. And so if that element is zero, or if that element is very close to zero, your solution might start to break down. Um, and so ideally you want to figure out a way to avoid the diagonal elements from being zero or close to zero. And the overall idea is that we can actually adjust the rows, the equations in our um, matrix, left-hand side and right-hand side, such that the elements on the diagonal are not zero. In fact, we can pick the equations with the maximum absolute value in that component of the of the matrix. And so yeah, dividing by diagonal elements, you know, can be bad if that's nearly zero. And so we can swap rows around on both sides of the equation, such that that row has the highest absolute value in that column to be located in that diagonal. And so the idea is you basically pre-multiply your two sides of your equation. So if your equation was AX equals B, 
we're going to deconstruct that a into lu, but we're also going to pre-multiply both sides by p. p is a pivoting or permutation matrix, and uh, it kind of has the form of an identity matrix, but a little bit adjusted sometimes. And so, yeah, you'd have plu times x equals p times b. And so basically, if you didn't want to permute or pivot the rows in your matrix, you would leave these um, to be on the diagonal. But if you if you wanted to, you could basically pick um, which rows you want in which order by pre-multiplying this P matrix uh, of the form like this. So this would have swapped the first and second rows of your equations. And if you want to check, I'm not going to go into it too much in this video. If you're curious, you can check the uh, PLU decomposition file in the code base. With that out of the way, we'll talk about the actual code. And I won't go into too much detail with the code because it's just all a bunch of random assembly stuff. But uh, I'll talk about how we're going to use these functions to solve important problems. Okay. So if you go to the suppository, we'll have these four different examples, well, four different directories. The first one is matrix types that will show us like, well, I'll just, let's go into it, let's just see. Example 18A, let's just run it. So what's this printing out? So it's got this pi matrix, so everything in here is pi, 3.13, four by four matrix, and we're basically checking is this matrix upper triangular, lower triangular, or diagonal? And it's it's checking. Somehow it's checking and it's saying, nope, not upper, nope, not lower, and no diagonal. Um, how about this one? This is pi's above and on the diagonal. So yes, it's upper triangular, but no, it's not lower triangular or diagonal. How about this matrix? Well, not upper triangular, but it is lower triangular. It's not diagonal. How about this matrix? It's uh, all three. This matrix is upper triangular or triangular and diagonal. So how does this work? Check out the code. Let's see what it's doing. Oops, can I shrink this a little bit? What do we got here? We have some includes the, I guess three that matter the most are these three that say is upper triangular, is lower triangular, and is diagonal. They're functions that I guess take inputs um, pointing to that matrix the size of the matrix and uh, some tolerance for your zero. Maybe you would, you would assume that 0 0.000001 is also zero. So yeah, this would be how you would check if your matrix was upper, lower, and diagonal. And so pretty simple. It's just uh, calling those functions, um, printing out whether or not the matrix is any of those three things. Great. How about example B? This is the step-by-step -step process for LU uh, decomposition. So let's, let's look at the code first. So what are we including here? We're including this LU decomposition file. And what does it do? It just takes an A matrix. And what it's going to do is it's going to, well, I can actually pull it up. Uh, math, linear algebra, LU, decomposition. This t uses a pivot list do little algorithm to deconstruct the square RSI by RSI matrix that address RDI, double precision numbers, into lower and upper triangular matrices stored together in the original memory space. So it's what I explained in the slides. And so if we take a look at the code again, we have that including, also we are we have some uh, functions to implement forward and backward substitution. We have some functions to just uh, kind of copy things around and make um, an identity matrix just for the sake of step-by-step. Uh, step. Um, so how does, this, how does this work? So let's run it. What's going on here? So this is our original A matrix that we're trying to solve. Let's try and solve AX equals B. Here's A and here's B. So the first thing we do is we call that LU decomposition matrix. And this is the decomposed LU in place. So in this case, these elements, these elements, and these elements are all part of the U matrix. 
and then this element and these two are part of the L matrix along with an implied set of three ones on the diagonal. So here's how that actually looks. Here's U. You can see U takes the six terms from this deconstructed A matrix and then L takes those three terms plus the implied ones on the diagonal. Okay, so the new problem is AX equals L, UX equals B. And we can use force substitution to find what UX is. I refer to that value as Y in the slides, but you can solve um, using forward substitution for that Y vector. And now your new equation is, your new problem is U times X equals Y. And we can use backward substitution to find X in that case. And here's what it looks like. So this is the solution to our problem. The problem AX equals B, which is right here, is solved by that. So I'm going to snag this. And let's open up Octave to check our work here. Let's plug in A and B. And if we take the solution of that system like this, our answer should be negative 0 0.7, 0 0.6, negative 1. Was that what it was? Let's run it again. Negative 0 0.7, 0 0.6, and negative 1. So yes, our algorithm worked. The LU factorization worked, as well as the backward and forward substitution also worked. We effectively solved for the unknown vector x. So that's great. That's example B. Now, example C, this was a more compact approach because you don't need to get all the intermediate steps all the time. Um, it's a lot of you know, work. So in this case, all we're doing is we're calling LU solve. Let's look at the code. This basically is a wrapper for everything else. It will do all the work, but you have to pass in everything. You have to pass in your um, destination vector for your unknowns. You have to also pass in the A matrix that you want to factor and then use to solve the equation, as well as your right-hand side vector would be at the location in RDX, as well as the size of your system, square system of dimension RCX. And so how does this work? Well, honestly, I think this what this um, is doing is, let me run it for you. So here is it's trying to solve AX equals B. Here is a large 10 by 10 system uh, with a bunch of random numbers in it. You can see here, they're all between, looks like zero and one. Um, and here is your right-hand side vector. And so we're trying to solve AX equals B. Here's A, here's B. And here is the solved X. This is, you know, we've called LU solve and it has spat out X. Now we can actually check our work, not only in Octave, but even with our own program, because we can, we can see if, hold on, let me clear everything. If AX equals B and we have X, well, then I can subtract, I can multiply our computed value for X times our A matrix and subtract off B and I should get, I should get zero, right? So we can do that here. Um, I, I did that. AX minus B is pretty much zero. So let's see how this worked in the code. So the first thing that happens is a bunch of printing, which is nonsense. And then it calls LU solve with the proper inputs. So it has a memory address for the A matrix, memory address for the B matrix, memory address destination for the X matrix and the size of the matrices. You call it LU solve, and it now has placed the answer in destination at RDI. And so we have some place in memory here, here dot X, that's a 10 by one array of doubles, so eight bytes each um, to fit that unknown vector. And so yeah, pretty simple, it, it solves the problem for us in one step. Very good. Now, what about example D? This one is a little bit special because it involves the pivoting. Um, and so it's not gonna matter so much for this example because all the numbers were kind of 
all the same order and the matrix was fully populated but um you know if you had numbers here that were very very close to zero or zero on the diagonal your pivoting would be actually very useful it's still going to have an effect on this but it's not going to be noticeable in terms of your answer because it it didn't really do anything valuable but anyway it's the same entries for a and for b as before and in this case we've used instead of lu solve we have another function called plu solve which not only spits out an x matrix which is the answer but it also spits out the permutation matrix so it, it enables you in this case you can see it wanted the instead of the zeroth row to be in entry zero it wanted the seventh row to be in the seventh to be in the first position because that gave it the best the highest absolute value at the zero zero diagonal it was in the seventh uh seventh row can we, can we tell that let's see looking at the first column of the a matrix is the seventh row aka the eighth row this one the highest absolute value the answer is yes and so you can begin to see how that permutation has an effect it's basically pulling the row that has the highest absolute value at the you know the ith column into the ith diagonal and so we've dragged the seventh row of our a matrix up here similarly we would then grab the fourth row the ninth row the sixth row you can see this p vector kind of tells you which rows we've grabbed in which order and remember you have to apply that operation not only to the a matrix but also to the b matrix because it's not just one hand of the equation but both sides of the equation that you have to you know swap around to keep things working but again even still you can see that our result is that ax minus b is zero meaning our solution for x is correct Lastly, let's check out the code here to see what it, what it was doing. How is this different? Well, it looks like the only difference is we changed the call of LU solve to PLU solve, which is all the same thing, except I believe you pass in an additional um, entry here. Yeah, R8. I got to change that. Let's do it right now. R8 needs to, con needs to contain the location that you want to return and use to compute the permutation array and so let's put that in here right now uh, plu solve that's going to be a double no it's not it's an it's an int I guess it's a u int at r8 so with that out of the way we've implemented not only lu but also plu decomposition and uh, we know that it works so we have the ability to solve these dense systems of any size. So I showed you examples with 10 by 10 matrices, but you can imagine this extends to 100 by 100 matrices, but you can tell that it would obviously be much more expensive computationally. With that, I'll end the video. I wanna thank you guys for watching. If you wanna hang out, we have a Discord server, last link in the description. I'll see you there.